Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we continue with our studies on this Sabbath, and we review what we've studied the last couple of weeks, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction as we discuss these admonitions and their position with what we are seeing right now within the movement. Shall we now ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you provide us, blessings that many times we take for granted. We thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We ask now that you direct us, help us mentally to be prepared, help us to participate, and show us, Father, that which we need to understand. We thank you for those that are here. I thank you for those that will participate. Help us each one to consider carefully the admonitions that you are providing and the directions that you are giving. Be with us now, each one. Help us to consider that which you would have us to do. Now and always, we thank you. We ask for your angels to surround us, for your spirit to open our minds, so that we might draw closer to you. For this we ask, for this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, can anyone tell me why we are going from the study of Ezekiel 9 to a study into Ezekiel 33? We covered the reason during the study of Ezekiel 9. There were several points that Mrs. White made where we need to be paying attention. Does anyone remember her admonitions that we covered in the last few weeks studies? I don't remember specifically, but I do know, you know, this is about the watchman, the warning. And um, so prior to the events that Ezekiel nine is symbolizing, there has to be a message of warning that goes out. Okay. So now I'm, I'm going to ask, this question. When we studied Ezekiel 9, was this providing us an overview of a message that is approved by God? Mm -hmm. So Ezekiel 9 is the way that God would have his message go out. I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, obviously, if you don't warn the wicked from his ways, then you then it's going to be God says he, he will require uh, the blood at thine hand, right? So I'm not sure if that's what you're you're getting to. I mean that because Ezekiel nine is talking about not so much it's not so much about the proclamation of the message, it's about the the destruction that's going to come. Right. And and obviously there's you know in Ezekiel uh thirty three they're going to be addressing the the destruction of Jerusalem itself. Right. So um that is particularly you're going to have the person who comes and reports about what he sees in the destruction. So you're going to have the escaped come from the destruction of Jerusalem. So I'm not sure exactly how how you're looking at it, but okay. that's the case. As we as we proceed into this this portion of the study, we're going to cover a little bit of what we addressed in Ezekiel nine. So the answer is has already been given, but we're going to address a few other things with that answer as we proceed today. Now, the segments of Ezekiel 33 are broken up by the translators, beginning in verse 1, according to the duty of a watchman in warning the people, Ezekiel is admonished of his duty in warning sinners. Who is Ezekiel representing at this time? Well, he represents God's people. Okay. Okay. Does he does he represent God's people within the movement? Well, yeah. So really specifically, Ezekiel represents um, this movement um, that is. So he represents Samuel Snow, right? Okay. And so the aspect of this movement that represents Samuel Snow's proclamation of the message, Samuel Snow's letters, and also Boston and Exeter, because obviously Boston is the fifth day. Of the fourth month, that's when Ezekiel begins his prophesying. 
and his last is the 10th day of the seventh month in Ezekiel 40. So Ezekiel is the proclamation of Samuel Snow's message. Okay. So, so yeah, he represents that movement in Millerite history, plus also the movement that accepts that understanding of Millerite history. Okay, do we all agree with that? Does anyone disagree with that? Now, I will be asking for participation. If I don't see other participation, I'll start calling on you individually. I agree. Thank you. So, beginning in verse 10, God showeth the manner of his dealings with the righteous that revolteth and with the returning sinner. God maintains the equity of his proceeding. By verse 21, upon the news of the taking of Jerusalem, Ezekiel prophesieth the desolation of the land. Now, if Ezekiel is representing the movement at this time, then we should be seeing something that is going to be of great import in regards to the taking of Jerusalem in the present day that will lead to a prophecy that is not hung upon time dealing with the desolation of the land. And here we have a figure that we have yet to address. By verse 30, the the hypocrisy of the captive Jews is reproved. Now, as Mrs. White provided admonition, she states, please read also the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. This is letter 54A of 1898. Can those who believe the gospel of Christ not see that the work now being done in medical missionary lines is the very work Christ commanded should be done? Now, here I thought Christ only commanded we need to keep the Sabbath. What does this statement mean to you? Well, you know, one of the problems I have with this statement is the way that it's been misused within Adventism. So, you know, I've obviously been involved in the medical missionary work. You know, I was uh, in the self-supporting work in British Columbia at Silver Hills and then started, a, at least we tried to start an institution in Alberta here, which never really got off the ground. And when we look at medical missionary work, if you read what Ellen White says about it, Often there is these things that try to pretend to be medical missionary work, but it's not. So I, I think it's not it's not as simple, like to say what is she talking about medical missionary? That's I think a question that needs to be asked. Well, I think we're going to get into this a little further, but the the statement that she's making here: Can those who believe the gospel of Christ not see that the work now being done in medical missionary lines? is the very work that Christ commanded to be done. What has been stated as being the medical missionary work? In uh, in that time? Well, the medical missionary work at that time? How about our time? Okay. Well, I, I don't see much medical missionary work being done along the lines that Ellen White talks about. I mean, definitely Adventist hospitals are not doing the medical missionary work. No, they're not. Yeah. But what? And many, and many of the, the so-called you know, met, so-called medical missionary work that's being done is just a type of fanaticism. It's new age and and mix, mixed up of all different kinds of things. Uh, I know Tanya Beeman went to some place. Uh, we had the Dublins in this movement. We had uh, uh, Michelle, who was supposedly doing medical missionary work. And, and this was something that Jeff had a problem with, is because there was just so much fanaticism regarding uh, the medical missionary work. So in Ellen White's day, I mean, I would look at what she talks about that should be done is something that's much more personal labor for your neighbors, not so much institutions. Are we able to give a witness by medical missionary work? Well, we, we can give a witness by medical missionary work, by ministering to those around us. Right. And, and it's difficult, like here in Canada, of course, everybody has free health care and, and, and so forth. But the medical missionary work isn't always just doing treatments to people who are sick. It's, it's much more dealing with the whole person. And, and it's a labor that, that's, it, it's something that's labor intensive. Yes, like it some, is. Sometimes takes years working with the person, helping them make good decisions, uh, you know, being an example to them, encouraging them spiritually as well as uh, physically. Here we here we have a situation. The, the answer that I was looking at is if the medical missionary work is indeed the right arm of the gospel, is this not our most powerful way of being able to reach hearts? 
Mm-hmm. But but all I'm trying to say is that sometimes what people think is the medical missionary work is quite different than what Ellen White says. Okay. Right. You know, because they've had in uh, the Canadian group, they would have this guy. I can't remember his name. An older guy that would come in. And then they also have, uh, what was it, Mark Johnson. And I don't consider that medical missionary. Right. Okay. We're talking about because because I read the councils of what Ellen White says medical missionary work is. And, and they think, you know, just doing some kind of natural treatment to somebody is medical missionary work. And, you know, it's it's much more involved in that. There's a lot that goes on to educating people correctly and giving them tools so that they can live uh, a different life, that they can make day to day decisions, being connected to God. And and some people try to you know, I, 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 I'm just I'm just critical when I hear about this. People believing that they're doing medical missionary work. It's a lot of lip service, but not really an understanding. Nobody, very few people have taken the time to study what Ellen White actually says about medical missionary work, what kind of training we need and and how to deliver that. So uh, that's all I'm saying that there is. And and here, you know, she's going to say it is by laying aside your self-assumed dignity and learning in the school of Christ how to wear his yoke and carry his burdens. And I don't see that in the people professing to do medical missionary. I see a lot of self and and very combative and critical uh, criticisms of others instead of just actually doing the work and training other people how to do it. I mean, for me, the model is Silver Hills where I was. I mean, I believe that was medical missionary work. So I haven't seen many places like that. I would say that probably um, Black Hills is pretty good as, as an institution. It's a little bigger than Silver Hills. Silver Hills is a little smaller, but uh, at least that you know they're training people how to do medical missionary work and helping people practically. So anyway, go on. Okay. Now, in the in the balance of this paragraph, as you you read the last line, but in between, mm-hmm. what is clearer than that those who are doing this work are fulfilling the Savior's commission? Brethren, do you believe the Word of God? Would you know how you can best please your Savior? It is best, it is by laying aside your self-assumed dignity and learning in the school of Christ how to wear his yoke and carry his burden. The world needs evidence of sincere Christianity. Spurious Christians have been seen everywhere. When the power of God's grace is felt in our churches, the members will work the works of Christ. Their natural and hereditary traits of character will be transformed by the spirit that dwelt in the greatest minister that ever trod the soil of this fallen world. The indwelling of the spirit will enable them to reveal Christ's likeness and in proportion to the purity of their piety will be the success of their work. Now, I will um, offer the following. Now, at this point, this week has been a bit of a um, difficult situation for me because there has been a lot that's been going on that has taken a lot of my time. Now, is medical missionary work shown? Let's say, let's say that someone that does not know of the movement and is not Seventh day Adventist comes to you to ask, what would you do differently for a specific health condition? Would this be something that you would consider to be medical missionary? It's definitely part of it. Okay. Now, the reason behind these first two paragraphs being addressed in this manner, I'm, I'm going to offer the following testimony. Before Sabbath on the 23rd of March, my mother had had a, an offer from a member of her church, and she's she's been a, a member of the Spokane Central Church for now for going on close to 46, well, no, longer now, almost 56 years. This member was offering to come to the house so mother could partake of communion. And on that day, my mother had stated, no, I, I believe we're going to be at church. But that morning she woke up, she was not feeling well, and decided not to go. At midnight on the 23rd, I was awakened because my mother believed that she had internal bleeding. We wound up going to an American hospital. Now, my mother is very well insured. She's also has Medicare. 
we arrived at the hospital and we were informed in the emergency room that it was going to be a wait and my mother was going to need to sit and wait in order to receive treatment. She couldn't sit long because she was in great pain. Now, long story short, she wound up having to lie on the floor of the waiting room for over five hours before they would agree to see her. When they finally got her into the exam room, they ran a CAT scan, assuming that she had kidney stones. They came back and they diagnosed a UTI and an E. coli infection. They gave her a set of pills and sent her home. Two days later, we were back in front of her doctor. We advised the doctor that she was still in pain. We advised the doctor that the pills were making her stomach upset. So the doctor spent 15 minutes and said, we're going to give you anti-nausea pills and we're going to give you a different antibiotic and sent her home. The following Sunday, we are back in the ER. She's seen a bit faster this time. The doctors were a little more attentive. The nurse was definitely more attentive. They hooked her up to an IV and said she was severely dehydrated and sent her home. The following day, I was told to call the primary care physician. Turned out he was out of town. I was advised that we will call you back. The doctor on call will be contacting you. The second reason for my call is that my mother requested an enema because she was having difficulty voiding her bowels. We received no call back. That evening, Jennifer, my fiance, left her employment and drove over because we prepared for what we would have to do as far as giving her an enema. There were other things that occurred the following day. We followed the instructions that Jennifer had been given. We were able to successfully give the enema and provide some relief, but my mother remained in pain. I took her to a private party so that she could have another IV, one with minerals, one with vitamins, one that offered natural healing. When we returned, I received a telephone call from the nurse practitioner in the office of the doctor, apologizing that no one had gotten back to us because the doctor on call was not even communicating with them. I told her what was happening. Within 30 minutes, I had a triage nurse on the phone instructing me to return to the hospital where we'd had these extended wait times. We did return to the hospital and the wait times were even longer than before. Two hours later, the same practitioner noted that I had returned the call and been told just to sit and wait. They suggested we go to a different hospital. They suggested we go to a different emergency room, one, quote, out of network, unquote. We went there. They were able to get mother in within 90 minutes. About four hours after that, they came back with a diagnosis due to a CAT scan and other tests of pneumonia and a stricture in the bowel. Now, as of yesterday, the ultimate diagnosis has been colon cancer and a stent has been placed. Now, for all of this, American medicine is going to be billing tens of thousands of dollars. However, throughout all of this, there has been opportunity to be able to witness to many. Very little of my family has anything to do with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There are a few of us that were raised within the church. I have had the opportunity this week to witness to Mormons, to Episcopalians, to Lutherans, to Catholics, about how these things are ongoing. Are these not the sheep that we are to be calling to come to the banquet? And how better can we do it than by being boots on the ground, ready to follow the instructions that Sister White and God's physician had given us so that we might be able to be prepared to open the door to these conversations. Yeah, now the one thing interesting just about, um, you know, the people around us and the information that they need. Um, now, for some reason in my life, I've been, I've dealt a lot more with mental illness than physical illness. Right. In, in other people. Um, so I've had lots of experience with people with mental illnesses and how to deal with them. You know, it's the eight natural doctors work just as well for uh, mental illness as they do for physical illness. But uh, it's that personal one-on-one -on -one 
uh, contact with people, I think that is the biggest. So, um, you know, we have a simple health message. Yeah, we do. It's not something where we have to know lots about, um, you know, because uh, I because I know Adventists in in the past there was a guy Dr. Sang Lee. I don't know if anybody knows him. He's no longer an Adventist. Uh, I don't know if he's alive still, but he he left Adventism l- way later in life. And and he used to do all these presentations explaining all the scientific reasons behind, you know, the health message. And I've never thought that that's very profitable. Because it's as if we put more weight upon science than upon the straight counsels in the spirit of prophecy. And we may not know exactly why things work. I mean, we need to understand some basics in physiology. We need to know how to recognize what problems exist. We need to know some natural natural treatments. But mostly it's just teaching people how to live and, and to depend upon God instead of upon man. But anyway, you can go on. That's just me interjecting. In these type of situations we have opportunity to be able to witness to others. We have the opportunity of being able to boots on the ground, fulfill the gospel commission. Many times we don't know what to do when the opportunity presents itself. Now, we don't know when we might be called. The question is, are we willing to be prepared? Now, our situation right now is and if, if you're going to draw an analogy, I'll draw this one. We need to be God's Marines right now. Now, this next letter, the first letter, letter 54A of 1898, you can compare this with Special Testimonies 11, 19.1. Gee, there's no symbol there. And letter 54 of 1898. Now, this next letter, 162 of 1900 was written on the 13th of July of 1900, which is the 14th day of the fourth month of the biblical year 5945. Is there a symbol as to when this this letter was written that we should be paying attention with? Well, 144. Yeah. 144,000. In reading Old Testament history, we see how particular the Lord was to make known his law in such a way as to impress the people. This law was of such great importance that the Lord sought in every way to make it familiar to the people. On the day when they crossed over Jordan, blessings were to be pronounced from Mount Gerizim upon the obedient and curses from Mount Ebal upon the disobedient. After each declaration, the congregation was to assent to the specifications. As they accepted the conditions, they placed themselves under a solemn responsibility to fulfill them. God desires to deter to deter them from transgression and to encourage them in obedience. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked but he takes the greatest pleasure in those who turn from sin. Now, I highlighted and bookended the opening and closing statements of this paragraph. But what is in between? Are we agreeing to a covenant relationship with God with no intent of fulfilling that covenant? How are we proceeding? The 33rd chapter of Ezekiel shows that God's government is a government of personal responsibility. Each one must stand for himself. No one can obey for his neighbor. No one is excused for neglecting his duty because of a similar neglect on the part of his neighbor. Now, what adage Had our parents used in a situation like this, have you ever heard two wrongs don't make a right? Yes. So the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel is showing us, providing us the information that God's government is a government of personal responsibility. Is there any advantage to being a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? No. Is there an advantage for us being a member of the movement? No. Thank you. We are all required to stand for ourselves. Upon the ministers of God rests a solemn, serious charge. They will be called to a strict account for the manner in which they have discharged their responsibility. If they do not tell the people of the binding claims of God's law, 
if they do not preach the word with clearness, but confuse the minds of the people by their own interpretations, they are shepherds who feed themselves, but neglect to feed the flock. They make of none effect the law of Jehovah, and souls perish because of their unfaithfulness. The blood of these souls will be upon their heads. God will call them to account for their unfaithfulness. But this will in no wise excuse those who listened to the sophistry of men, discarding the word of God. God's law is a transcript of his character, and his word is not yea and nay, but yea and amen. How better do we have the ability to show the claims of God's law than by first taking care of the pain that someone is in by being of service to them? In the ninth chapter of Ezekiel is portrayed the fate of the men of responsibility who have not glorified God by faithfulness and integrity. Read this chapter. Notice especially verses 4 to 6. And here the Lord is saying unto him, the man clothed in linen, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at the ancient men which were before the house. At the appointed time, the Lord God of Israel will do his work most thoroughly. Brothers and sisters, I present before you that that appointed time may well be upon us. The 33rd chapter of Ezekiel is an outline of the work that God approves. Those In the position of sacred trust, those honored of God by being appointed to stand as watchmen on the walls of Zion are in every respect to be all that is embraced in the meaning of the word watchman. They are to be ever on guard against the dangers threatening the spiritual life and health and prosperity of God's heritage. This chapter is an outline for us. It is an example for us to show the work that God approves. So I'm going back to my initial question. If the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel is the work that God approves, what is the ninth chapter of the of the book of Ezekiel? Is that also the work that God approves? I would assume it would be, yes. You would assume that? When when I I I, I would it uh, yeah it's 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 but it's what we're supposed to be doing yes okay brother William I'm I'm going to state it this way would you want to be one of those that does not receive the mark in the forehead no I don't want to be one that receives the mark in the forehead no I do not see I I want to be one of those that receives the mark in the forehead because they are the ones that are sighing and crying. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Okay. All right. Yeah. My point is. I thought you was talking about something else. I'm sorry. No, no. Brother, that you're fine. The point point being here, my premise to you from the study that we've already done in Ezekiel 9 is that Ezekiel 9 is showing the work that God has not approved and the result of that work being done. For what happens to those that are doing the work that God does not approve? They don't have the mark. They don't have the mark. And what happened? And what happens to them? They get slaughtered. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. On both ends of this, God is trying to show us, here is what I don't approve. Here is what I do approve. Here is Mount Ebal. Here is Mount Gerizim. 
the end is again shown from the beginning. How many times does our Heavenly Father need to show us these things before we're willing to listen? Upon us as ministers, God has placed a burden of solemn responsibility, realizing that we are his chosen watchmen. We should have constant concern and forethought in regard to the state of the church. We should give much time to earnest prayer for divine wisdom and guidance in order that we may know how best to promote God's honor and glory. Now, in this statement, are we to promote our own honor and glory? What say you? No, we're not. Whose honor and glory are we to promote? Jesus Christ. All right. And if we are promoting Christ's honor and glory, whose honor is also being given? Is it not God the Father? Amen. He has commissioned us to honor him, the omnipotent one, in every word and in every act. From him comes our maintenance. We are wholly dependent upon his sufficiency, his bounty for our support. So are we dependent upon man in any way? Where is our faith to reside? And upon whom are we to lean? This next section was written on the 25th of October of 1904 which was the 14th day of the seventh month of the biblical year 5949. Warnings come from God to his watchmen, telling them of the necessity of keeping a close, earnest, watchful guard. Satan, with all his host, is on the field of battle. He will employ every stratagem possible to obtain advantages over God's people. Let the watchmen of the Lord search the scriptures closely. Let them put all their powers to use in the Lord's service. Let them not think that the present is a time when they can afford to be at ease. For the thief cometh to steal and to destroy, if possible, the sheep of God's pasture. I am instructed to bear to our people the message that Satan is working with all his misappropriated power to overcome them. He works by whisperings. He works by surmisings. He works by causing bitterness among believers so that threatened dangers can scarcely be mentioned because some will say it is a thrust to do injury to souls. Let those who say this get out of the path of evil and they will not think that the sword that is cutting against evil workers is turned against them. The two-edged sword of truth cuts both ways, right and left. For the word of God must reach the people. The attention of men and women must be aroused. Let those who are continually complaining keep out of the way and let the sword of the Spirit do its work. Read the 33rd and the 34th chapters of Ezekiel and make straight paths for your feet. Let the lame be turned out of the way. The instruction contained in these chapters is not a pleasing fable, but the truth of God. Read and study this instruction and put the power of your understanding to the utmost stretch to understand what it means to those living in these last days. We are to make use of our God-given minds. And sometimes we have to exercise those minds in ways that they haven't been exercised in a very long time. There is a great need now of men who understand what it means to live for God in a world where idolatry and all other kinds of iniquity prevail. Men and women have been blindfolded by the theories and the skepticism of Satan. Because iniquity shall abound, many will depart from the truth, from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. If it were possible, Satan would deceive the very elect. 
Heavy responsibility rests upon those who stand in positions of trust in the cause of God. The work of proclaiming the third angel's message should be carried forward in the power of the Spirit. The present is a time of fearful peril, and those who stand in positions of responsibility are not to keep silent. Of what use are sleepy watchmen who cannot see the threatening danger and who do not warn the people? Now, let's remember, this was written in 1904. This was written at a time well after 1844. So it was written 60 years after this opening for the third angel's message. So, brothers and sisters, are we willing to stand awake as a watchman? Or are we being described as sleepy watchmen who cannot see the threatening danger and who are not warning the people? Where do we stand today? Where do you stand on this subject at this time? Any thoughts, any questions for what we have covered at this point? Yeah, I do want to mark a God. I'm- okay. Consider carefully how we best can do this. Consider carefully if we are going to be those of the city that have received the mark in the forehead or those that are about to endure the slaughtering. Shall we now close this session? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing. We thank you for the warnings that are coming so that we may consider carefully our own positions. Be with us now. Direct us so that what we do may bring glory to you and not to those men or to ourselves. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and study. I pray, Father, for your blessing upon the message that is soon to be given. Be with Brother Theodore. Help us each one to listen and to learn. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.